Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the state. Uh, today, we have our session, Interdisciplinary Teaching in a Social Studies Classroom, and our presenter today is Sherry Michalowski from Elmbrook, Elmbrook School District in Brookfield, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. Uh, Sherry will probably take a couple attempts to remind me that she is the president of the Wisconsin Council for the Social Studies because <laughs> of me. Um, so I figured I should beat her to that punch. Um, I was running for president of the Wisconsin Council for the Social Studies when I accepted this job in Maine. And uh, we were in the middle of closing ballots and I was the only person running. So I reached out and I said, Sherry, you should do this. And so now uh, four years later, she's still in the middle of that job and blames me for all of the uh, mm -hmm. stuff in her life. So uh, without any further yeah, ado, I will. But the, what's, what's the thing to take away in that conversation is that of all the potential people on the board, Sherry, you're the one I trusted. <laughs> um, to step into that position and it's yeah he didn't tell me i'd be running a conference for two years in a row <laughs> and yeah there's a lot i've learned a lot <laughs> but i appreciate it though what's I'm important is that she's a really good middle school teacher and she's going to tell you about how she connects with students in an interdisciplinary method so without any further ado sherry michalowski michalowski of elmbrook school district hi everybody um thank you for having me i appreciate it um, this makes me very nervous. There's no question about that. Um, when Joe was organizing all of this, um, I kind of threw my hat in there saying, hey, I can help. And then when I saw the names of people, I kind of let myself fall to the bottom and fall to the bottom and fall to the bottom. And then he reached out to me again because the person in Wisconsin um, who is in Joe, Joe's role mentioned that I do work with interdisciplinary and I saw that. And um, it's a passion of mine, I love it. Um, but when Joe and I talked, I said, if you're expecting this, um, all this technology and bells and whistles, I can't do that right now, because just like many of you, um, I just got done teaching um, on Friday. And on Friday, not only did I get done teaching, but my grades were due and I had to have my classroom packed up, which was kind of hard to do virtually. Um, and all the rules that went around that. And so um, just feeling like you, I said, I can talk about this if we can do informal. I'm about informal, that's what I feel really good with. Um, but I can share a couple things. And it was funny in the process of thinking about this, I found that maybe I don't have to be quite as informal um, as I was going to because I realized, oh my gosh, I just did one of these. So who am I? Um, I've been teaching. Um, this is going on my 31st year in the Elmbrook School District. I've taught eighth grade social studies. A few times throughout the years, I've taught some ELA, um, but most of it's been eighth grade social studies. Um, prior to that, I was teaching in parochial schools um, more towards the Western part of the state where I graduated from um, Eau Claire and, um, and um, got my master's degree in um, teacher leadership. Um, I am nationally board certified or just finished my last year of 10 years of being nationally board certified, which was really a difficult thing because the first time I did my, my attempt, I failed it. And that was, that was really hard to pull up those boot, boot strings and try again. Um, but um, I think in all these years, the piece that's most powerful is um, being in a middle school, believing in middle school. I'm not sure and if we had time, we could do introductions and all those things. Um, but a middle school, true middle school philosophy back when I first started teaching was um, founded on this idea along with looking at students, not only um, academically, but looking at them socially and emotionally. And one good way to do that would be through interdisciplinary teaching. So I'm kind of grounded in that world. Unfortunately, um, as time has come, and gone, this role of interdisciplinary teaching has, um, I haven't been able to do it the way that I believe in it. And so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about it. And I'm going to share an example that just happened. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, I was able to do this. So this um, is what I'll do. Um, you have to look at your own situations of where you are and what you're doing. You'll probably hear me share a few um, opinions that I hope I don't ruffle feathers, but it's just my experience. So those are my opinions. Um, I'm, that's why I like this kind of being an open 
forum so I can learn from people who might disagree or who might have questions about my opinions. Um, but um, I saw this quote, now my, half my quote is hidden now because of you all, but I thought this was interesting. Social studies is like lima beans on a curricular plate of elementary students. And I thought that was a fascinating quote. It probably has nothing to do with this other than I hate lima beans. And so when I saw this quote the other day, I was like, oh my gosh, do elementary teachers really hate social studies? Um, and it really just, it just gave me something to ponder and to think about um, and the why. Um, a lot of our students at our middle school, so I'm in a six, seven, eight school. Six, sixth grade is world history, I'm sorry, ancient civilizations. Seventh grade is um, like the constitution to immigration. Isn't that a funny word to immigration? Like which immigration, you all know 1900s, but I mean, we could be going till, to today, right? Um, and then eighth grade, which is what I teach, is, is a current issues course. And it started out as a regional geography and it's turned, we turned it into a concept world issues. Um, globalization is one unit, conflict's another, movement of people. Um, really, really, really love the concept that we worked with. And then they, it's important to know that our kids go to world history afterward. So um, in a middle school for many, many years, when we were working as a house team, house structure, interdisciplinary teaching was a very natural thing. Um, when you had an English teacher and you had one math teacher and you had one science teacher, and then you had your social studies teacher, the four of us met more than once weekly and we would talk about curriculum and we would find ways to make things work. Over time, that changed because with budget cuts and things like that, we had more cross housing. So we lost the ability to really do this and I'll explain what that means in a moment. But the first question, that always came was, is it integrated? Is it interdisciplinary or was it thematic? And it's really a question of th semantics. It really comes down to that. Um, I get real lost in a word sometimes. So I would dig my heels along the words of interdisciplinary. Um, even though a lot of people like to mix these words up and we're probably um, saying the same thing. Um, my husband and I, we celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary on Sunday, and we find that we say the same thing all the time. We just use different words. Maybe it's why we stayed married this long, but we have to figure out the words because I'll say one way and he'll say it another. Um, but this is the same thing. Um, integrated, but when I found a document, kind of trying to separate it out, and the document I thought really did a nice job of explaining the three different things. An integrated unit, um, you don't see the differences in the subject matters. Um, there's no clear distinction between them. Um, and they used soup as an example, it's like tomato soup. And you know there's milk, or, you know, depending if you use canned soup, right? If you use a canned tomato soup, you know the one that gels out and you put that soup in there and you mix it with the milk or the water, depending on what you have in your cupboard that day um, or where you are financially, it all becomes a, oops. I'm sorry. Um, it all becomes just this tomato soup and there's no distinction. And I think that happens a lot that we just naturally in social studies will teach reading because we have to read, right? Or we in social studies teach writing. That's become um, the reading and the writing instructional has changed over time. Um, when I first started and I taught with lots of secondary teachers who were demoted to the middle school. So if you were a high school teacher when I first started, like in 1989 in the middle school I'm in, and you came from the high school, that was like a punishment to the middle school. And they were not reading teachers and they were not writing teachers. Um, but I equate kind of the integrated as we take the subject matters and we just, that's what we do. Nothing wrong with it, it's just what we do. Interdisciplinary becomes, um, you don't know where the line, the lines are very clear, there's no blur. Okay, it's very clear what, whose standards, whose um, outcomes, whose um, learning targets are being taught because you're sharing in that and you're very, very clear with that. And they, the article that I read described it as chicken noodle soup. You can see all the differences. It was such a good, such a good um, analogy. Thematic becomes more of a theme. 
And thematic was the battle I fought for a very long time. I can live in the integrated and I could comfort, very comfortably live in the interdisciplinary, but what I, I struggled with was thematic. At a time where themes were not as big, so you could have a theme of conflict or you could have a theme of, um, with, especially with, um, 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 with questioning and things like that, you have this commonality. But what was common as my years of teaching social studies in a middle school was let's pick a theme and all of us do something related to it. And I'm gonna simplify it to like an elementary classroom. And if there's an elementary teacher, I apologize, but it would be like in the fall, let's all do a fall theme. Well, then you might understand what I'm gonna say is, let's all do a fall theme. And I'm sitting here like, I'm in, eighth, I'm in social studies. I have nothing related to fall in my standards and my curriculum, but what I can do is put apples all over my sheets. And now I look like I'm part of the team. That used to just rub me the wrong way. Well, can't you just, and you're gonna find in this conversation that I struggle with, can't you just? Can't you just put apples on there? Can't you just put a clown on your sheet? Can't you count this and count that? But that's not my curriculum. And then we're so short on time already that we lost track of what we're supposed to be doing. And so to me, I struggled always with thematic. Now, over time, like essential questions didn't even exist when I first started teaching. That, I mean, I find that fascinating, right? Essential questions. I am, my classroom is driven on essential questions. I have one gigantic overarching question. And with questioning now, with essential questions, we could probably be more integrated, interdisciplinary, if we all could share a question, like a question for the year or a question for a quarter, and then tie our, our standards and stuff into that. I think that's more plausible. But when I first started this, the theme was take a theme and then everyone just try to make it fit. And I struggled with that, especially because time has always been somewhat of an issue. So before I move forward, is there, are there any questions related to this? Someone who wants to add on, someone who wants to disagree with me? Feel free. You're a quiet bunch. I don't see everybody's faces. Okay, so when you look at interdisciplinary teaching, I think the number one thing to think about is you've got to bring everyone together at the plate or the table where we're going to be doing our interdisciplinary teaching. Let me take a step aside for one moment, seriously a step aside. Um, I'm a, I use HyperDocs. I don't know how many of you are familiar with HyperDocs, but I am an avid, avid, avid user of HyperDocs. You're gonna see two of them here that you'll have access to. Um, I would tell you about three years ago, um, I've got this problem. I always tell my friends and family that I am kind of addicted to um, professional development. So when we could start doing all this stuff online, I could look like I'm watching America's Got Talent and have a thing in my ear and be getting PD at the same time and looking like I'm part of the family. I could hide it with my hair and no one would know, just like the eighth graders do, right? Um, and so I sat in and listened to these women talk about hyperdocs and it was like, oh, you found the answer to everything I've been looking for. You just handed it to me. And so for that time, um, hyperdocs are um, how, I, how I work through my classroom. And it did pay off for me through the virtual teaching because my students were um, comfortable with them coming into virtual teaching and we didn't change it at all. So they really understood how we would communicate back and forth. So those of you not familiar with hyperdocs, you're gonna see them here. That's a conversation for another time that I'll gladly talk about, but I'm not an expert by any means. Um, if you are familiar, you'll probably see some similarity to the HyperDoc ladies and some of their templates and stuff. So anyway, step back away from, any questions about HyperDocs at all before I move forward? I just threw that out there real quickly. Okay, anybody? We're such a quiet group. This is why doing it this way is not fun because I could walk right up to you and say, you got a question. So, so uh, go ahead. Whoop. Um, I, um, I have a lot to learn. Um, I have not used HyperDocs at all, and but it looks really good overall, interesting, and something the kids would definitely want to work with. So hopefully I'll learn about it all uh, later. 
and you have my contact information. Um, I'm a one-on-one -on -one school, device school, so keep that in mind. So I've kind of worked on a lot of those kind of kinks. Um, but if we want to talk later, or you Google it, there's so much stuff out there on HyperDoc. Um, yeah, I imagine. There I is. There's yeah. a book out there too. So, you know, you've got my contact though. So if, if, if at some point you want to chat and you want to look through this a little bit better or more, let me know. And I can kind of share my experiences, which is a classroom experience with eighth graders. And if I can get eighth graders to work through this and you're going to see a couple different things. Yep. So thank you. Anybody else a question about that? Because it's a really good way to integrate. You're going to see how that happened accidentally. Because oh, Sherry, um, this is Amber. I just wanted Amber. you to know that I actually don't know what it is so okay. i'm very interested to just um sit back and take a look and watch we can tell joe to set up another meeting sometime for us to talk about hyperdocs how's that sound <laughs> that's great thank you <laughs> if, if there's interest i can hi joe <laughs> if there's interest i can talk it through because it's been a work in progress for um like i said about three years and so what a hyperdoc is truly is just a document where you have your information and and there's a couple different ways of doing it i do it where my students will make a copy of this so the one you see in front of you um students make copies of and then they share them back with me i i work off of canvas so they share the url and i can see it live as they're working on it the left side of my documents are generally where i'm sharing information that's where the learning takes place and the right side is where they respond okay so if you can imagine it's like a it's a word it's a word document you know it's off of google it's a google doc and um it's hyper because it has all these hyperlinks i think i think that's if i remember correctly so you're going to see like everything is there and what's a beautiful thing in a few minutes you can see where when i use hyper docs when we go back to integrating and this is huge and with especially with um special ed when i use hyper docs i can change my document um I can change documents for students to meet their individual needs and it will look exactly the same as everybody else's but it might say on here where it says find and share three to five or more links theirs might just say share three links theirs might just say share one link but everything looks identical the only time there's a problem with that and that's another story for another time is when you have them turn and talk and they turn next to someone and they're kind of doing a little bit different and that's confusing but for the most part um it, it, it works really well that way. Um, so this one that was created by accident that you see a, um, a snippet of happened as a result of um, it just a couple weeks ago. I have not been able to do interdisciplinary teaching. Um, it, has, it has gone away from me over the last four years in particular, because over the last four years, true houses where you just have four teachers with a set group of 100 students, 125 students in my building in my district has kind of gone away over the last four years. Now I have a new principal who's bringing it back. So next year we will have three teachers. They'll pull math out because there's just too much mixing with math, but it's a start and it's a move back to where I started, which is so exciting for me. So I'll work with one ELA teacher, one science teacher and myself. Um, in order to truly um, integrate, you need time. You need people on board. You need to be able to think and be creative with that thought process and look beyond, well, I've always done this on September 5th, so why wouldn't I do it now? You have to kind of look a little bit bigger with what you're doing and see where things fit. Because what it does with integrating is, um, or interdisciplinary is, everybody's standards are still going to be met and everybody has a piece in of the pie if you will and a responsibility it's not well i can't fit into that so i'm just going to put pictures of africa on my um, science papers so i can look like i'm doing an integrated unit on africa um, or it's interdisciplinary um, it truly has to it has to be real and that takes some time and some thought um, it takes some trust. You have to trust and you have to know what other people are teaching. And like over time, because my team wasn't meeting because we had so many, you also, it's harder to do with cross house. When I speak to those of you who aren't middle school, cross house means um, I have the same students as three other teachers, but there's five who are GT. So they go to another teacher for English because they're in a higher English class. And so now we've lost the ability because they lose 
that piece and it gets a little harder. So the less cross housing, the easier it is. It doesn't mean always that I'm responsible for teaching other people's stuff. We're all kind of embedded in it and doing it together. Um, and I'll show you how that works a little bit. So the example I have here, I'm going to try to get to my example. Um, so if I, oh, I'm not going to lose anybody. Yay. Ah, perfect. So during um, our virtual learning, one of my students, Riley, I'll say her first name, um, Riley had a hard time being in school all year. Coming to school was a problem for Riley. And no matter what we could do, she just didn't come to school. So it was no surprise that during um, our virtual school, the same thing would happen. The difference would be that in virtual school, she'd pop in and out all over the place. And her dad had a tendency to email us at certain points. You can, if those you know, probably at mid nine and in the quarters and want a list of all the work. And then we'd get this whole list together and still nothing would ever get done. And Riley um, deals with some mental health issues. She's got a mess at home. School's not her priority. And um, so we ended up with an email again from her father. Um, gosh, uh, beginning of May, right around mid nine, a little bit like second week of May maybe. And again, he wanted all the work she was missing and he wanted a list. And so our school social workers started generating a list. I said, wait a minute, let's have a meeting. This is getting ridiculous people that <laughs> we are continually giving her list. It's not gonna happen. We all knew it wasn't gonna happen. So I proposed, so we had all of our teachers there. So we had her art teacher. I'm gonna tell you this worked out because it was, um, the way it worked out was because of virtual teaching and COVID-19. It would not have worked out in our building this way and this seamlessly if we were not able to meet virtually like we are right now and to be able to talk about our standards real quickly and to find a topic and try to do it that way, okay? So we got the teachers together, her art teacher, her robotics teacher, her tech ed teacher, her music teacher, science, social studies, ELA, and um, math. No, math pulled out of this and I'll explain why. Because math couldn't make it work. Math could not find a standard where they were with what they were doing that would line up. It could be a, a satisfied by this. So math pulled out of this. And what we did is we created an interdisciplinary unit of study on COVID-19 for Riley. We thought maybe talking about COVID-19, what's going on in the world around her. Um, I spoke with her because I, I wanted to make sure her mental health was okay to talk about this, that it wasn't something that would add to the anxiety that she experienced. When she saw this, she was very excited. Um, my goal for Riley, and I shared that with everyone, the goal, and I shared this with Riley, is I want you to finish one thing this year that you can feel good about. This was not going to erase grades and all those other things, but it was finishing something that you could be proud of. And we were just gonna take it one day at a time, so we didn't put any, um, we didn't, I don't know if we put any guidelines on it or anything like that. Just work on it when you can. So when you look at it, and um, I'll scroll, you're gonna see it started out as an, um, as an introduction. And our art teacher, in my classroom, um, I start almost every class with observations and wonderings, and it's always with images. And Riley was in my classroom enough to know that's how we always started class. And so we put that in there. there was, so the hyperdoc she was familiar with, and this idea, we tried to keep things as familiar as possible, observations and wonderings. So, our teacher found three sites um, that she could work on for some street art. Um, Riley is a doodler. She likes, she's artistic. She likes to draw. So you're going to see where those pieces are in there. And so we gave her an opportunity to look at street art and to see what was coming out, like the positives that was coming out of the COVID-19. Um, also, because she was an eighth grader, we put an option in there for her to find three to five um, video related um, videos related to music that was coming out of this time. We put um, this, my 21 Pilots level of concern was one of the first songs that came out. So you'll see that that's there, the video is there. And then she would go through and she would find songs and um, that, that, that resonated with her. The next step, again, we're working off of the art standards. So the art teacher had shared with us a few standards that he was working with. She was to create something. 
um, using the um, art that we saw with COVID-19 and using the music and to generate a piece of art um, that would come from this. Um, and then take a picture of it and post it here. So you see the left side is the directions for those of you who are inquiring about um, HyperDocs. The left side is the lesson, um, the instructional piece. The right side is where she would put links and stuff. Um, in social studies, we found a couple of different things um, to help her have a background on COVID. And so we found an article where she had to read a couple of different things there and then the COVID-19, because in my current issues course, we could talk about very comfortably the disease and vocabulary is one of our um, one of our learning targets. So this all kind of tied in together, as well as we have um, targets for um, communication. So this lended itself really well for my class. Science teacher um, had an article about the respiratory system, and then she had a video. And I'm not sure if it's still in here or not, but she had a video that she used with the rest of her students earlier. They were doing um, human body at that time. And at first her thought was, I don't, what I, she wasn't sure how she could tie in. And then as we were discussing this, as everybody was kind of thinking of ways to tie in, again, it's a discussion. This took us an hour, hour and a half to just figure out how we could all tie in with our standards that we were responsible for. She realized at that point that she could do her respiratory stuff related to COVID-19. And so she found her learning targets on the respiratory systems and that was her, and the video she used with her kids, she brought that in there. So all the work that Riley missed in science didn't matter because she could put it here and we just focused on that small piece. Again, our goal was just some work completion from Riley. So you can see on that left side, those were the science things that she tied in with the respiratory system in COVID-19. ELA teacher, um, they were in the middle of doing um, some work related to COVID-19, which we did not realize at the time. And they were interviewing family members about COVID-19. And Riley, for some reason, had interviewed one of her family members. She, that was one thing she did do. So she was able to put that link in there for um, showing evidence and then explained it on the right-hand side. And then there was a poem here that we, um, that was being shared in the LA classes to discuss related to COVID-19 and gave Riley an opportunity to do that. Again, all related to the ELA standards. Our, um, our ELA is a little harder to integrate with um, and do interdisciplinary teaching with because they, are, um, they do the workshop model and they're very limited with how much flexibility they have. They're, they're more flexible today than they were three years ago which is a good thing, but that, that is so scripted and you can't deviate. So that does become a little bit of a problem when you look at interdisciplinary work. Um, especially ours are watched very closely um, because it's all tied to our district goals, the reading and map scores and all of that. So our ELA teachers are very apprehensive about stepping away from the script, but we found something for here. Her robotics teacher was just about ready to bow out, saying there's not much I can do here. And then it dawned on her that she had just used an article in one of her classes about the robotics and how robots and, and in COVID-19. And so she was able to pull that as well as a video and still reach um, a standard, find the standard that it would work with. The art teacher, um, that, was, that was probably our best. He has a, a class called Community Art that um, Riley was in, and so but she had not attended and did much of the work there. So with art, you're going to see the Signs of Hope assignment that he did, and he was able to take that one assignment and place it in here, and he put a couple videos in there. So a couple of the teachers did videos in there. Um, and then her social media marketing class, they all, um, they all, um, had to do a wee video on something, I'm not quite sure, or whatever. And so that was Riley's final product was to create a video on this. Now, all of us talked about our standards. All of us, um, everybody, I, I kind of put the document together. Everybody um, put their stuff in the document. I kind of cleaned it up so that it was uniform and parallel. Um, and this became our document. She was very excited um, to do this. Her family members were very grateful. Everybody felt this, uh, this was something she could accomplish, um, but she didn't. 
And um, the hard part of that was she didn't. And so, um, so what do we do next? Well, I, I was like, oh my God, we put so much time into this and probably we'll never fit anywhere else. You know, everything will be outdated and old. So we took this unit and um, my partner who I co-teach with, we used it, um, we do enrichment in our um, like genius hour type of thing, enrichment. And we always put ours at the end of the year. So we, at the end of the year, we're supposed to do it like every week, twice a week for 20 minutes. Well, with eighth graders, that's a waste of time. So we added up all the minutes we throw it at the end of the year. And that's another conversation for another time. And so we gave our students an opportunity for enrichment of a topic of choice, or they could do this, we shared this document with them to do with COVID-19. And almost all of our kids, which I did not realize, we had talked about COVID-19 in January, and I did not do much with it during virtual teaching and learning because I didn't want, I felt like they were getting so much of it at home and on TV and stuff, so I kind of steered away, but a lot of them wanted to do this, and they did. And if you look down below, you'll see that there are four links that you'll have access to that you can see what some of our kids did as a result of this document. So Riley didn't use it. It didn't become a waste of our time because about 150 students did use it as is. Um, because it was enrichment, we adjusted a little bit the art and um, the science pieces and the ELA pieces because they'd already been in those classes but we kept it, we kept all of those classes in the original document for them, in a, in a document for them. And the way I was able to do that is, you know, because it's a Google Doc, all I had to do was make a copy of Riley's and then I could adjust and change it so I didn't have to redo everything and then just give it a new name and that's how that worked. So that's the interdisciplinary piece of this document with COVID-19 that happened accidentally that I have not been able to do over the last few years because my students might have three different math teachers overall. Um, some of them would have two different science teachers and two different um, ELA teachers. So for the whole eighth grade to be on the same page, that's virtually impossible. Trying to get three of us on the same page is um, a possibility. All of us is impossible. And then you're doing, all those kids have all different people, so it gets hard. I'm hopeful that we'll move back to this with the changes that have come with my new administration, which is one of the reasons I've decided to stay in education another year is because I am that hopeful that we can get back to what I think is quality teaching. And it's, um, it's meaningful. It makes connections. Kids naturally, what we know about our brain is our brain learns best when we make connections. And when kids can make a connection in another class with what you're doing, that's the best way, of, that's the best learning that can take place. When they see their teachers using the same language, that's huge. Um, we work with our ELA teachers a lot on do you use the word thesis or do you use the word claim? And right now we're trying to decide what's the best word to use because the high school uses thesis. So we've talked to the world history teachers as eighth grade. So we're trying to figure out what's the best way to not confuse our students, but that's what interdisciplinary teaching is. You come together, you look at what you're teaching, you look at your standards, your outcomes, your learning targets, and you find the best way to instruct. What it's not is I'm a reading teacher and I'm going to read My Brother Sam is Dead or Johnny Tremaine, because those books are still being read. They were read when I taught on uh, reading, um, gosh, how many years ago, 39 years ago? And we'll read those books and we won't talk about the Civil War. We won't talk about the Revolutionary War, but we'll say we did it. That's not interdisciplinary, okay? Um, interdisciplinary is truly looking at your standards and how, how we can find what's common and how we can bridge that together. So any questions about, I'll show you one that I work with special ed and ELA in a moment, but any questions about this one in particular? That's a lot. I have a quick question. Um, sure. I'm Carla. I'm from Brunswick. Hi, I teach seventh grade um, and we do work in teams and houses and my LA teacher and I do a lot of interdisciplinary learning and expeditionary learning. Um, so it's really exciting to hear a different point of view and I love that hyperdoc. Um, I guess my question is when you create an interdisciplinary unit, what are you looking at for a length of time? Is it 
for a week, a unit, two weeks? I think that that's the beauty of this. It can be whatever. I mean, it really can. And I'm not saying that to be trite. Um, it can be whatever. This was this was short. Um, you could do a whole unit if you went with a theme. And you know how I feel about a theme. But even if you had a theme, like if my theme um, is a five week theme, like we do um, conflict. And if everyone agreed that in five weeks we could come up with something they could do as a big thing, which is for, I don't think that's possible anymore, just given all of our standards. So I think you just kind of have to decide how long you want it to be. I think some things lose energy when it's too long. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. I think sometimes too long is too much. Um, sometimes I think we, we um, overdo why not um, a Thursday and a Friday where we come together and we're all going to try to hit this target and we do some kind of an assessment. I'll kind of show you where we kind of did that um, on the pieces that we need. Um, I don't think we have to make it too big. I think starting small is not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, I like yeah. the idea of starting small because that way if you're not including a, a teacher then they don't feel really left out because a lot of times our math teacher either chooses not to participate or it doesn't fit you know her standards mm -hmm. um and this way we're just doing it for two to five days it's not like yes oh, we're all doing something and she's not so i like that that's a good and, and you can do math and social studies sometimes it doesn't have to be all of them and i think that's why the conversations and the discussing are huge you know um a lot of times when you're on a new team like one of the things they would make us do they don't they being whoever they are you know who they are. I don't have to say who they are, but they, they would make us, what are you doing this week? And what they didn't realize is if you're talking about what we're doing this week, your, your interdisciplinary is not happening. It's too late. We've already planned our lessons and we've got our vision. And a lot of, I'm sorry, that's my daughter calling me. I'm sorry. She just bought a new house. That's probably why she's calling me. Um, my interdisciplinary, um, you have to understand that, that has to start early. That has to start really early on. And it's a puzzle. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And it comes together naturally. It's not forced. I don't do well when it's forced. Like I said, this was totally by accident. And it was more that I was digging my heels and I refused to do another, um, I refused to do another um, list. It wasn't gonna make sense. We still kind of have a list here, right? Um, but small is good. And sometimes it works with science better. And sometimes it works with math better. It just depends on where you can find it. And maybe at the beginning of the year, you start looking at your standards and you say, okay, we can fit here and we can fit here and create a puzzle and then work off of it from there. That's what I think is the best bet. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else got a question for me? I'm turning my phone down. There you go. So, uh, go ahead. Hi, thanks for uh, coming and sharing uh, today. Um, when it comes to, uh, I, I know you mentioned uh, theme isn't your favorite, um, but or thematic. Um, if it doesn't seem workable for the other two to happen, is thematic still kind of like you know the 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 best worst option there, or do you, would you kind of recommend staying away from it entirely? Personally, I tried really hard to stay away from it, except when I look like that person who wasn't being a team player. And then I, I, my belief is that you can make almost anything fit. I mean, if you really, really think, but you gotta think and you gotta, you gotta mess with it and play with it. Um, so if I didn't look like a team player, I, w I mean, we do theme days and stuff like that and I'd still do those. Um, I, that's why I got kind of funky with the words more of it instead of thematic unit I would call it a you know I really um, interdisciplinary to me makes more sense um, to be pure but that's my that's my gist on um, semantics because I get funky with that um, but to be a team player or maybe to encourage someone who might not feel as much yeah why not you know what I mean a lot of times people don't think they can do this and if that's the best we can do to get started why not I mean, in the end, it's what's best for the kids. And are we meeting our goals? And are we, you know, are we, um, and being okay, I'm gonna, in a minute, um, I'll show you the, the, the obstacles. And one of the obstacles is the collaboration and non-collaborators. 
how do you get them to buy in? And if the best you can do is get them to buy in that way, that's it, then let's do it. I would never say never. I wouldn't want to, and I've done it, but, but I also want it to be what's best for kids, and that, that trumps it all. Am I answering your question without giving you an answer? <laughs> uh, you did, did a good job of answering. Pretty good with that. <laughs> It is a good question though. I mean, it's just, we deal, in the end we deal with people and people are passionate about what they teach. You all know that you're here because you are. And we have to respect that and acknowledge that um, and not judge. And that's hard not to do like, why won't you? And then trying to still make people like Carla said, feel involved because we have feelings in there too. And it just becomes such a balancing act, you know. Let me share real quickly in ELA and social studies one that again, through um, our virtual teaching, we threw together. So we had a young man again, who was um, special ed, he had an IP. And he really, this, <laughs> his story is another one. He didn't finish this one either. I wish I had victories for you guys. I do have some victories, <laughs> but this isn't them. But we um, did a hyperdoc again together. My ELA teacher does not do hyperdocs. But we knew that um, we knew that Elijah worked off of Hyperdocs. And so you're going to see that she was struggling getting him to write a narrative on a social issue. And his social issue, so when they were doing this, I was in the middle of an environmental issue. And to help their special ed teacher not have to do 20,000 different topics, I strongly encouraged um, the ELA teacher and the special ed teacher to try to get our um, special ed students to lean towards an environmental issue because that's what we were doing in social studies. So that was, a, that was um, a way that they could kind of integrate, okay? It wasn't interdisciplinary, it was kind of integrating our topics. And so that's what he did, he did pollution and we were doing all, you know, we were doing pollution on Mount Everest and some work with that. And so when you look at these documents, they're a mix of social studies things that I was asking him to do that was related to our topics and related to the pollution topic. So what I did is knowing he was going to do pollution, um, my, my standard relates around um, humans and the effect they have on the environment. That's what my standard is. So I didn't have to do what my class, my student, the rest of my students were doing. So we created this with him. So you can see at the top of it where it says, um, I'm trying to get him to watch a video and to interact and kind of questions, what are his thoughts? Um, and then on the next box where it's kind of highlighted, you're going to see where he wrote his um, claim. And um, so that's what I was going to try to find things to support his claim. And then you can see that's where the ELA teacher was working in there. So I kind of generated this document and she started plugging in. This document uh, allows people flexibility. So when you create a hyperdoc and you say, okay, I've created this, now you put your stuff in there. They're comfortable, people are comfortable with that because they own those pieces and it's theirs. And so that I, that I felt really was helpful. So you can see he, she's got him um, working off of that. And then as we scroll down, as I scroll here, you're gonna see here, I start with those images again. Um, because in my class, we did a lot of work related to the images. So that's when anytime you see that, that's where we're kind of pulling that social studies connection. Um, again, related, I read, I saw the articles he was reading. I, um, I saw what she wanted him to do. It connected perfectly with what I was going to do. And we also have that communication piece that I have to have that's a target for me, a learning target and a standard. So here he's doing, so you can see, it's, it's kind of hard to see where the ELA and the social studies stops and begins, but that's, that's, it's pretty seamless then. So she, you're gonna see she's kind of taking him through the steps again. Here are his articles um, that he found with her the ELA teacher. Again, I knew he was going to have to come up with some ways to improve the problem. So I found some articles relate or some videos related to that. Um, reading is hard for Elijah. Um, if it were me, I would, I, the person who put this together is a, someone I've taught with for a long time. She and I'll have a conversation later because I felt the articles she gave him were too high, high of a lexile for him. Um, which made it harder. So when I could put something out there, I tried to stay with more video-ish because the reading was hard enough for him. Um, he did get support with um, his special ed teacher and he did get support from our support staff, our, um, our teaching aides for special ed also supported him through this. 
So you can see it just kind of continued on and we broke it down by day for him. And you're gonna see that left side was always the work he needed to do, the right side was working the things that he needed to go to. And you can see finally, this took a little bit of time. Um, it was like pulling teeth. I mean, he, and so what ended up happening is he, we combined the science and social studies. So he knew that he had, you know, about 45 minutes to an hour a day where he'd have to work on this document, which would be his, I'm sorry, ELA and social studies. And it was a struggle. It, um, you know, it was put together for him to use. Um, he was supposed to do a presentation at the end, just like the rest of his classmates did, um, create a slideshow just like that. So the directions were very similar to what the rest of his classmates were doing. It was just, it just took on a different appearance because we brought in the ELA piece. So that's a way that you can even work it with um, students um, who are special ed. I struggle when it comes to um, inclusion, my classes have always had special ed students in it since way back when, all levels of special ed. And um, one, of my, one of my biggest pet peeves is, well, can't they just? Um, no, if I've got standards, that's what they have to do. Can't, we've got to find things to help them get to that standard. And if they can't, can we find meaningful things that they can do, my students can do, all students can do, that is relative to what I'm teaching. And that's hard, that's hard. Um, when I teach conflict, I have um, CD students that don't even know what the word conflict mean. And um, how do you teach them about the Syrian war? So I work very, very hard to have their work be meaningful. I work very hard to have it line up with what we're doing and it's never can't they just. And it's hard, it's hard work, that's, a, that's another whole issue. But um, so with Elijah, in the hyperdocs, it allows a lot of my, um, so it's with some of my special ed students, if they have a, um, um, a reading disability, I can link in articles that they can read or that um, are lower lexiles that meet their needs and everything kind of looks the same. And that, that's important to these children that they are with their peers and um, boy, they're proud of their work. And so Elijah did not complete his. However, we did one similar, not exactly the same with a different ELA teacher, for Audie and Audie did get through all of it. It was work, it, I'm telling you, it's not, it's not easy just because I have this pretty document, um, but he was able to get through it. So, so that's what a, one with that, we, that's an ELA and just social studies together and um, how that one worked. So with um, a special ed um, appearance to it. Um, I, we don't put all of our, we didn't put all of our learning targets on here. We did not put all of our standards on here. Um, by choice, you know, these things would be hanging up in our classroom usually. My hyperdocs usually have standards on them. Um, um, or their learning targets at least. Um, but with these ones, we didn't do that just by virtual. You know, with virtual learning, I could take away some of those things and say, oh, I was virtual learning, I forgot. So it just kind of allowed, allowed us to be a little bit more flexible. And we took advantage of that flexibility. I mean, because it was for the kids. So any questions about either of these that I can answer? I think it was a good thing that you took away the, the learning targets or the standards because, you know, the document is great. And, and I do, did something like this with virtual learning, but I didn't know it had a name. Um, but I think sometimes if it's too wordy, the kids get bogged down. So I think to remove as many words as you can by getting rid of the, the targets or the standards was a positive thing for the kids. Yeah, you know, and who is it there for? Is it for, let's be real, Carla, who's that? Who are those learning targets there for? My administrator. Right. <laughs> They're not there for me. I know what the target is. It's on my board, right? It's not, the kids aren't going back and looking at the learning target. And if they were, it's on my board in the classroom. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I agree. I think it becomes cumbersome and overwhelming. And if you think about Elijah, he had enough words on his document as it was. And went, yeah, so yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. But I like how you have everything in one place, the links, you know, the directions and the student work. And I, I just think it's a really neat format and Thank you. logical. Yeah, and just imagine then, like you know, you you generate something like this, and I and like again, when Joe when Joe asked me to do this, I had no example. Honest to God, when he asked me, I was like, oh, I don't have any examples. I don't know what I'm going to do, and I was just going to put nothing up here. And seriously, this weekend, I was like, oh, I have this. I didn't even think about it. Um, but the 
the HyperDoc itself or any document you create, it doesn't have to be a HyperDoc, but if you can create a, a, a platform, a foundational type of thing that everyone can plug in, that's huge. That's the piece that's huge. None of my, um, none of the teachers had a problem plugging in stuff there at all. They, it was very comfortable for them. They found pictures, they found images. What I did is I cleaned up and put charts and stuff in there because I know what my students needed after three years of working on a HyperDoc. I knew they needed a couple things in there to help guide the work of a HyperDoc, but I changed nothing that they did. And it was, but it started with a meeting. Um, here, let me try this. It started with a meeting and here you go because yeah, it's like climbing a mountain. Interdisciplinary learning is like climbing a mountain. So I was last summer um, out at Jackson Hole, Hole doing some work with National Geographic and one of my images, and I was looking through my phone, I'm like, this is exactly it. So what are the mountains that you climb? You have to, the non-collaborators, who doesn't want to do it, who can't do it, who doesn't have the same vision, who just in their frame of mind or with their curriculum can't even, you know? Time is big, time is big. Assessments are huge. How do we do an assessment? How do we evaluate? Um, um, you have to play all of that in there. And those become the obstacles. Those really become the obstacles. Um, I was just talking to someone last night and I said, I can, I can deal with non-collaborators. I, I can deal with the obstacles. If you have the idea and you want to run with the idea and you want to play with it and you want to roll up our sleeves, we can do anything. Um, I thought when as I was putting this together, this was perfect because the mountains are out there, but the path is taking us to it. And if we have the same, if we have the same goal, which is our path, and we do that together, those mountains don't seem so big after all. Do you know what I'm saying? And I don't say that to sound like, um, well, I, I could go into the kumbaya and hold hands stuff, but that's an, again, I don't mean to sound trow, trite or, um, I just, it's serious. It's it's time, and if you can find people who buy into it, it really works. It really does. And like I said to you, I'm very excited about being able to go back into that journey because I haven't been able to do that um, in the last few years. So um, I thank Joe for inviting me with you all because it allows me. It allowed me to talk about it again. It allowed me to go do um, googling interdisciplinary units, the manic. It's out there. All that stuff is there. Um, some stuff's better than others. Um, but to me, when you start Googling all that stuff, then you're moving away from your actual standards when you pull somebody else's up. So you start with the work you've already done and reshape it. Don't go out and start over again. Take the work you've done and how can you make it fit together? That's the puzzle pieces. Don't go buy a new puzzle. Use the puzzle pieces you have and how do you make them fit? Because that's what's natural. That's, that's the real, that's the connection. And I think too often we just wanna, um, you know, we do, we jump on the internet or all the students that I teach at the co collegiate level, you know where they head right away, teachers pay teachers. But now you're starting over again. Take what you have, talk about it. The time is worth it on the front end of the conversation because the back end, you end up with products that um, work well. How's that? I think that's all I got. <laughs> what do you mean that's all you have? That was pretty good, as usual, Sherry. <laughs> Told you I can talk. I have a BS degree. <laughs> um, she, does anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? You're in good company. Joe can talk, too. Yeah, it's a Wisconsin thing. Wisconsin thing. <laughs> Any questions or comments, anything? I wanted to thank you for um, providing the, the two column. I tried using hyperdoxis during this remote learning. I liked it. I liked that it would take the kids to different places, but because I hadn't introduced it to them in my regular classroom prior mm -hmm. to that, there was a huge learning curve and they couldn't figure out where they needed to turn things in. I tried Google Docs, I tried a bunch of different things so having it right there where you have the instructions and then where they can put their answers 
looks amazing. So I'm going to try that next. So thank you. Yeah, and our kids would turn them into um, Canvas. But if you don't have a platform like that, you know, it's always sharing the URL. Don't have them share the doc, have them share the URL. It has to come from that share button. But what we've done, my partner and I, because we've kind of bumped through this a lot, is we create one document with all of their names on that. And then we teach them how to hyperlink those in. So teach your students how to do a hyperlink. And so they'll, they'll take their document, they'll take the shared URL. And it's important with the shared URL because with the shared URL, you can see it in live time. So when I'm sitting there and I'm watching somebody in a corner, it doesn't look like they're working, I can open up their document live and I can type them a message saying, hey, what are you doing right now? Because I don't see you getting much done here, right? And it's not intrusive. I'm not standing over them, you know. Um, but you can get them to save it. So it's just, and once you create the document with their names, you always just make a copy and a copy. So if you don't have it, does that make sense what I've just said, how you do that? You yeah. just oh, hyperlink it to their name. We're a Google Suite school, so. Oh, that's perfect. Everything is, I mean, if they share it with me, if they yep. share the paper doc on, I'm sure it will come up as a presentation. If they share it with me, then I can see what they're working on. And yeah, so it's yeah, just that it's the, it's the URL that makes that difference. So yes. keep that. Fine. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked it. Uh-huh. Anybody else? I, um, I just want to say uh, thanks for sharing not only kind of more effective ways to kind of do cross-curricular stuff, but also just the honesty that it's not always going to work. Uh, it's nice to know that, you know, even if we do things perfectly, it doesn't mean it's going to always work out, but, uh, it's about providing the best possible opportunity for the students and we can't always control the outcome, but I just appreciate the honesty because sometimes you hear people make it seem like, oh, if you do X, Y, and Z, it works a hundred percent of the time. No, um, so I that. <laughs> no um, if I'm one thing, I'm honest and that sometimes can get me in trouble. Um, education is not that easy. You all know that. I'm st and I said, one of my, I'm still in the classroom. You know, I, I know what it looks like every single day with you all. I know, I know. And um, it's not, it's not easy. And so I'm just very happy that I was able to think quick enough that, hey, let's offer this help to the rest of the kids, because I would have been so disappointed. And they did work really well with it. The, you know, the mass majority I had 85% of my kids pretty engaged during the learning, so I was pretty lucky with that. And some really cool stuff came out of that. And so it it didn't it didn't go for naught, um, but I was lucky with that, so I was happy. Um, I wish the story, oh, she did more on that document than she did most of her other stuff. So I, there is a little bit of a celebration. So thank you, Neil. Thank you. Well, I think setting it up like that also lets the kids work at their own pace. Yes, and they like that. All that they need to do, and the kids can move along. They can drag their feet if they want, but they still see all that they need to do, or they can just yeah. buzz right through and get it done. And When we did it with virtual learning, we, we did a document a week. We did a hyperdoc a week. And what we did, um, there was one week where we kind of extended it, but when we did it, what we, we put suggest, suggested finish dates, but we let kids work ahead. Right. And everything was a suggestion, and it was an end due date just for the reason you said there, that sometimes they could get more done, but we have students and IEPs and stuff that drive breakdown and breaking down the assignments. So with every assignment in, the, in our documents, we did a breakdown. Um, so that did happen, um, but um, we allowed students to work ahead on this one. When I'm in the classroom, we kind of hold that up a little bit, um, depending on what we're doing, depending on what we're doing. And then you can do like um, hyper, you can do hyperdocs on slides, and that limits them too sometimes. So it just depends. Yeah, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Absolutely. Karina, I've seen you unmute a couple times. Yes, I have. I just wanted to say that, um, that I mean, right from the get-go, your description of integrated interdisciplinary and thematic were hugely helpful um, because I have been dealing with, particularly during distance learning, um, one member of my team and, and we do the, you know, I'm social studies and we've got an ELA math science. Um, and one member of the team wanted to do basically integrated. And I said, okay, but I still have my curriculum. How about we do this? And she said, no, she didn't want to do that. That wasn't what she was interested in. She was more interested in integrated. And I'm like, but I still have my own curriculum. So hearing mm -hmm. you say, you know, the can't they just, and, and uh, no, we have our standards we have to get to is just mm -hmm. reaffirming for me that, that I made the right decision because um, I caught some flack for that. And mm -hmm. 
and the the end result was well maybe we can do more of that next year and i'm and i'm thinking i still have standards so this yeah. was really really helpful and i've got a page full of notes here and Good. we did start using hyperdocs but because they were all new to us teachers um we used them basically just to organize their work for the week but then they went to google classroom for that so this gives me a lot more information on how that's going to work Good to hear. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you have to just be able to bow out. When our math teacher sat here and she was with us, she wanted to be a part of it. Um, I found it surprising that she couldn't make a connection, but maybe where they were and what they were required to do. So she, for Riley, so Riley did this document for us, and that was supposed to be 45 minutes a day, like in the morning. And in the afternoon, she was supposed to spend 30 minutes on Alex math which was, you know, it's an individualized type of thing. Yeah, yeah we have it too. So, so, she, that, so she had those two things out there for her to do. And you have to just be okay to bow out sometimes. I mean, it is what it is and be respectful of that. So hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you very much. Because You're very this welcome. Really thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Are we okay? Any last questions for Sherry on the record? I don't have another question, but I am thrilled. I'm so glad I was able to be here. Um, actually, I'm just, I'm just an ed tech. <laughs> I'm not even a teacher, but uh, 20 or so years in this and adaptability was always a big thing whether it was physical work or mental work or school work or whatever. So, um, y yes, again, thank you. The presentation is wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I've seen some, a bit of it happen where I work and I think there will be more, um, as we go on with all this crazy business. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's what you got to do anyway. And it's mm -hmm. almost like um, um, uh, you can't, it, special ed can be um, individualized or you try to, but the regular ed kids need the same thing. So you got all different level kids, you got all different kinds of learning, like you said, learning styles and the way, different teachers. And this, you know, when you put all these things together, it just like makes so much sense and it looks mm -hmm. fun to learn with even. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I'm so glad I was able to see this. And Thank you. Uh, thanks and, and have more well, fun. Well, thanks the virus. I had, a, I had the example. So another good thing that came out of the virus. <laughs> it looks like you've been using it forever. <laughs> So, Kirsten, before you go, there's you're not just an ed tech. We can't do no, our I to say that. Yes. We can't do our jobs without our ed techs. I, I was an ed tech for ten years before oh I became a teacher. So, well, um, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Jen. But just I know I always got into the mind frame of we're just an ed tech, yeah. but you're mm -hmm. not just an ed tech because you have to oh, know the students and you are able to take them and do you're able to put all the subjects together and do exactly what Sherry just did with us. Mm -hmm. So you're not just an ed tech. Yeah, I so depended on, I would guess it's similar to a support staff or an aide. Oh my gosh. So my aides would be working with some of my special ed students on these things that I would create like Elijah's and I would pop in. So I knew they had scheduled meetings and I would pop in and I felt so bad because um, Elijah would always tell them his computer wasn't working or his screen wasn't working or whatever. And I'd pop in and they loved it because all of a sudden miraculously the camera worked when I would pop in, you know, or the one time his, uh, his camera, like his login changed to unknown 69. And I'm sitting here looking at this like, what, what? Elijah, explain to me the 69. And he's like, uh, I said, go find a new one. Go find your, I mean, so, the work that they had to deal with. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have been. So yeah, I'm glad you said that, Jen. That's huge. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wish we could use this with a few of our students, like the ones that you get were exampling. Um, yeah, that's why I hope more of this is, is used in one way or another. Oh, yeah. 
Any other questions for Sherry while we're still recording? Well, Sherry, I will give you then our formal thank you from our participants, those who are still here and those who've left, um, for sharing an hour of your time and expertise, even though you continued to tell me that you were the wrong person to do it. I think the people here um, are disagreeing with that. So um, thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for um, allowing me to be here. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. And um, you all have my contact there. I have an email. I think a lot of the, I think I put a couple of the links in there. Um, most of the stuff is shareable with you all. Make copies and do whatever. Um, feel free to contact me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Joe, you and I will talk at another time. Um, we have a minute, okay?